Hello and welcome to Newsnight. I am Ladi Akiri Duluale. Thanks for being with us. My guest on the program today says that his conviction for misappropriation of funds by the courts was the height of political victimization, even though he admits to having learned some salient lessons following a presidential pardon granted him earlier this year. My guest also says whoever will be Nigeria's next leader must go back to the 2014 National Conference resolutions if the country is to witness peace and justice. Newsnight talks to the former governor of Nigeria's north central state of Plato, Chief Joshua Darie. Chief Darie, thank you yeah. for your time. Welcome to the program. Thank you. My pleasure, my viewers. Let's, uh, let's begin uh, from a general note before we come to specifics. Let me ask you about uh, what has happened uh, in the recent past. What is your view generally about Nigeria's uh, security situation as it stands today? Well, it's deplorable, and uh, I guess that it needs a collective resolve for everybody, because security is not just the security of uh, uh, well, the, 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 all the agencies are doing their best, but right from the world to the district level, I believe that all harm must be on deck, because the rate at which is uh, becoming deteriorated, it gives room for concern. Nigerians are contemplating living in the country, and I don't think it's good. If we have the political will collectively, I believe we can overcome it. But as the situation start, uh, stands, we're, we are going to be dealing with two big things uh, in the very near future. One is the 2023 general election. Uh, the second, uh, which is going to take place at almost the same time, is the national census. Uh, do you think either of these two activities uh, will be affected by this insecurity? Uh, uh, given that they are going to be exercises expected to be carried out nationwide? Uh, I believe that, uh, well, the 2023, if we get the people properly synthesized and then the uh, security people deploy, uh, properly deployed, I don't think there will be any quality of the same. Also, um, everybody is going to vote not for more than 10 uh, presidential aspirants especially for the presidency, and then the tactics uh, governors. You, you know, it is a matter of commitment. If it worked in the past, it will work better this time around. More so that there have been improvement in the election process, where the result will be transmitted electronically to the center. So I don't think that there will be any type of uh, confusion, fighting, infighting. We cannot rule out mischief, but appropriate security should be deployed. Adequate. Let me use the word adequate. There is, uh, as you say, um, you know, given the, the run-up to all these events, if we talk about the, uh, the primaries that the parties underwent and the selection of the candidates at uh, presidential, governorship, and indeed other levels, the National Assembly and so on, it has been attended by, you know, significant acrimony, uh, which in, you know, some of the parties is still ongoing, including the two major parties, one of which you belong to. So... I don't know uh, uh, how come you seem to be uh, quite optimistic that all of this will really not matter. There is quite a bit of acrimony in many of the states. There are people who are still in court over the outcome of the primaries uh, and all of that. Even at the national mm -hmm. level, there are ongoing crises. Well, there's a timeline for all these events because um, it is not infinitum. Because um, in every election process where internal democracy is not maintained, definitely people will have a way of expressing themselves where I or X, Y, Z feel the franchise. They will go. In some cases, some governors play the role of landlords, just, you know, stampeding people and then say, Mr. X is the candidate. That should not be the case. But where people uh, participate collectively, you find that you reduce the rancor, you reduce the economy. But as long as uh, things are not properly done and there's no transparency, there's no sense of justice, people will go either to the lower court or the higher court to express their own, uh, you know, realize their dreams. But I believe that this electoral processes and uh, pre-election matters, they are time bound. If you, you can't tell me forever. You know, it's like, remember 1999, there were people who were doing horse trading. They will do as if they are going to stand as candidates. At the end of the day, of course, they have negotiated in the dark. And then they will say, oh, I've stepped down for X, Y, Z. So, ego base is always there. Some people, ego has been bruised. So, if you don't know how to massage the ego, 
They are likely not going to participate or go along with you. So it's a matter of using diplomatic ties. You employ diplomacy in convincing him. You beg him, bend power and power to accommodate whatever he has. You know, so I think that is what part of democracy. You see, I always a growing democracy. The internal party, because a lot of what you've spoken about speaks to internal party democracy. That is the democracy within the parties themselves to select candidates. And uh, I'll come to, uh, you know, what, what that does for those who participate. But the Electoral Act 2022 was supposed to make some of these things history. Some of the processes that had created acrimony in the past, the Electoral Act of 2022 uh, as amended was supposed to uh, bring many of these things under the ambit of the law and for it to be very clear what needed to be done. For example, if you were going to uh, talk about a consensus candidate, there's now a clearly spelt out process how a consensus candidate should emerge from within the party. But it doesn't seem to have yes. addressed, uh, uh, addressed some of the problems. You were a governor and many people have accused the governors, as you just did, uh, of being the ones who play king uh, and say, look, this is the candidate and that's the end. If you don't agree, you can go jump into the ocean. So what exactly is it that has happened? Well, over the years, when we started in 1999, the people that emerged as governors or even president have emerged through a natural process. There was no uh, godfatherism, maybe in a few extreme cases. But then, like myself, you look at my state. I'm one of the youngest people, but a small minority. It was just God's divine grace that brought me on board. It wasn't a matter of, the people wanted to have their way, but, you know, the majority, because democracy was followed, it was option A for, if you are not popular among the electorate, nobody will vote you in your vote or even constituency. But over the years, as we, you know, after the, uh, our tenure, some kind of, uh, I don't know, I don't, I don't want to use a strong word. People were just planted as cassava uh, without even, uh, you'll find somebody from the civil service who has not been a party member. Today he's the candidate. If you don't like, go and hang. That has destroyed democracy. And so people, this thing has we are carried over as a backlog. Uh, recently, if you watch what most of the states, people have been bought forms as delegates. When they come there, unfortunately, they cannot vote. So they are democratized. And that is what is causing all this confusion. So it's not government of the people, for the people and by the people. That's the essence of democracy. Everybody is to collectively participate. If you collectively participate, consensus is not difficult to arrive at. There may be 10 candidates, you have them to talk to themselves, as they engage themselves constructively, at the end of the day, not all of them will be. One person will be, you said, my friend, if you, I, I, make, I make it up, I'll give you a commissioner, I'll do this. And you are sincere. I believe it will work. It has worked in many places. It's just the grit, the, the grit that goes with man. So, you know, people are not trying to build a uh, legacy. They are building dynasty. If you are looking at your own family dynasty, you will stamp people and it will not go well. That's why you find protest vote, people within the party working against the party. It doesn't work any longer. People are more aware, more civilized, more conscious of their right. And I believe that uh, it's coming to an end. There is a new phenomenon that has happened uh, since that period you talked about, which is the issue of placeholders, that is, People actually put people in positions to hold the post for them while they try to get bigger positions. And then if they don't get those bigger positions, they come back and take the positions that were theirs or they were host holding before. Uh, and then, uh, you know, the placeholder either steps aside, resigns or does something else. But this has also led to acrimony in the sense that some of the placeholders perhaps having you know, be made aware of what the post is host, holding uh, in terms of benefits, then refuse to give up the places uh, for those who they were supposedly holding uh, them for. I mean, uh, is this not a step back that we are taking? Well, that is uh, African insurance. It's a way we do it in Nigerian style. Otherwise, uh, if you are going for post, there's no reason to sit back and say, oh, hold this thing for me. When if I don't make it, I'll come back. And the president will say, look, I want to try it as well. If you are able to go there, what is wrong with me? So that is just it. But in a few cases too, if it's a convenient arrangement, the man will automatically say, I've resigned. That pays well for peace. But if you say no, of course, you will remain the candidate of the party. If the party said, let man, the man stand, they will stand. And at the end of the day, he will become the natural candidate, whether he wins or doesn't win.
you are currently in the APC, but when I spoke to you first, you were governor of Plata State then, and you were in the PDP. Uh, yes. Your journey from PDP to APC, some have described as uh, opportunistic. In fact, there were many who were saying that you moved from PDP to APC because you wanted to be protected against uh, prosecution. Uh, uh, is that correct? Why did you leave the PDP for the APC? No, that is the wrong version. That is not true. Um, let me say, I have moved from APC, PDP to Labour Party and back to PDP, uh, back to APC. So what happened when I was, I was in the PDP, I won my election in the PDP. So it's not, when, if I had gone to APC to, to run my election, that would have been opportunistic. I went and I run the election in PDP, a very keen competition, two candidates, and I defeated them hands down. I even went for the, the, the general election, uh, the difference of uh, 18,000, not questionable. It was when I saw the need that, okay, Lalong, who was my you know, young man who was raised a speaker, having come together, uh, the journalist asked him, do you want me to join you and give you more support? And it made sense. So that was why I joined. Otherwise, it was not a personal benefit. It's not a matter of prosecution. Even in the PDP, I was still attending court. Thank God I went through it and I'm back. So I wasn't running away. I never knew. I never ran away from this country. Whether but it was then, right or wrong, it is now part then, of history. But then there are those who say that actually the reason why you left uh, uh, for APC uh, was the fact that you were looking for protection from a uh, prosecution. No, that's not the rule of general application because there are people who are APC who may not have been prosecuted and uh, whatever. I don't want to go into issues that are personal. I have my conviction. I wanted to go where Plato people fell. You remember the law in March and the Plato project. I could have remained in isolation. I move where the wind blows, where my people are. That is, I have been in that uh, the state for long. I've led the state for four years, eight years. I've been their senator again. So if that is where Plato people are, I would rightly have belong there. You've had uh, you've had uh, a turbulent political career, uh, Chief Dari. Um, that eight years you talked about as governor, and when you made reference to us speaking at the time, uh, there was a state of emergency in the state at that time, uh, and then there was the impeachment which you challenged. There was your impeachment which you challenged all the way to the Supreme Court before you were restored. Uh, and then you finished your tenure uh, and then went on to other political activities. Uh, and then, of course, you then went on, as you just said, and did a couple of other things. Uh, is it Plato State as a state that is politically turbulent? Or is it the political choices that you made that were turbulent? Or which one is it? Because there are those who would ask and say that, you know, uh, uh, Chief Daria, you've had this checkered thing. So how do you explain it? Well, there is this popular saying that success is um, success has many wings. Failure is an orphan. I became governor at a very, very young age of who I mean, said that has X that, X this. Envy became the after President Abbas came in 2001 to commission projects. He wouldn't even finish. Then some people felt that if we allow this young man to continue steadily the way he's going, uh, things will not be okay. Unfortunately, he was beheaded by the late Senator Banku who wanted to become the super supreme commander. And he was the author and manufacturer of uh, State of Emergency. Uh, he felt we were not part of the third term deal, and therefore we needed to be consigned to the dustbin of history. I was part of State of Emergency. There were other crises in Kano, in Katsina, in Lagos. Nobody was chased outside because they didn't have a mantra in their state. And that was what happened. Unfortunately, anything you do without God will backfire. After the six months, I came back and bounced back. And they went again using four people of so in the midnight as early as 6 a.m. and declined me in pitch. Businesses in Nigeria are conducted at 8 a.m. And they fell short of the uh constitutional requirement. And then even the order of conducting business in Nigeria, you don't start at 6 a.m. That was why the Supreme Court just threw it up. When I came back, I completed my tenure. So it's not that Plato is turbulent, Plato is more stable. Even when they wanted to do it to one other governor, I said, no, no, no. That should not be our portion. We must not allow it to become a recurring decimal. Because if you do that, it will be a cycle, a cycle that unless you break that course, it will be a reproach to the people. So I believe that uh, some great people were the one who are in charge of the day. Whatever they say to the power that be, they believe it. 
And that's the end of the day. So if you, and you know, like um, Lady Legua said, evil done to a man by a man will never go unpunished. It's not punished by a man, it's punished by God. The triumph of evil over God is temporary. So their triumph, their reign has diminished. And they have been concerned with just been in history. Instead of me, today, I am alive by the grace of God. You mentioned that, and I also, as you were speaking, uh, I, 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 I recollect that uh, part of that checkered history is what you have gone through subsequently uh, after, after yeah. you left office. Uh, uh, before I come to any other thing, can I just ask you about what is your view today about what you went through, the entire court process over corruption charges and uh, uh, you're going to prison, and then now today you are a free man. What what is your experience? What 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 was your experience like? Well, let me first of all thank Mr. President and Commander in Chief President Buhari Jesevar, who was magnanimous and granted his pardon myself and joining Yame and some of that people. You know, my issue was political in the sense that the same charges was taken to Kaduna Federal High Court. Justice Liman dismissed that yes. They were not happy. They carried the same document to the Plaza House of Assembly. Not anything said, and the whole amount we are talking about is 1.1 billion. 800 million went to Plato said account, 100 million went to PDP Southwest, 100 million went to our uh, campaign organization, 80 million went to the ecological fund, and then 60 million or 6 million went to PDP Plato said of 274 word. Every board got about 200,000 naira. What was missing, the balance figure is 4 million, which is a uh, commission on turnover. And the judge asked, if Mr. Dalia wanted to convert money to his personal use, will he use it to the head and ride the bank? Please distribute as follows. I'm a chartered accountant, my brother, and I wouldn't have been that foolish. If I wanted to steal, I would have lumped the money in commission on turnover, and that never happened. But because it was politically motivated, they didn't succeed in the uh, state of emergency. The court, I mean, the other vehicle of prosecution, EFC, became the only veritable tool. So they came to the House of Assembly. And when they first courageous people, they couldn't succeed. They even brought Mr. Clark from London. And when they asked him, he ran away. So the only sense of justice, by the way, determined they had a friendly court where when they made pronouncement. I don't think there was any sense of justice, but as I'm fine, I leave the rest of God. Time will tell. Time will tell. So uh, from what you've said, the indication I have is that you think that in spite of the fact that this case took so long, and it went through all the courts that you've mentioned, right all the way up until the Supreme Court, which found you guilty. Yes. Uh, you don't agree. You don't think you are guilty. You believe that all of this was politically orchestrated. It wasn't based on the fact that you took Plateau State money. No, no. If you look at the charges, the Supreme Court made pronouncement. All the other one, the financial misappropriation, where, 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 where how would I call it? were thrown away, were newly fired. They only held me for one charge. They said misappropriation. That is the donation to PDP. So if that is the case, I think it as part of the cross of serving uh, uh, in a democracy. If that donation amount of criminal misappropriation, so be it. There are people who have done more damaging than that one. They are not in prison. But I take it and I thank God. It's part of the criminal of life. It will make me a better uh, human being, a better leader, a better citizen, and I'll size more caution next time. I don't even have the opportunity. Do you do and you people think can also that, learn from my mistake? Do you think that, you know, I mean, fine, you, you you talked about the fact that, you know, if you what you were accused of, what you what eventually you were convicted of, uh, was something that a lot of other people had done. But do you think that it is quite possible that what you were accused of was damaging to your people in Plato State? Uh, uh, what, what was described as misappropriation was damaging to your people in Plato State. The people of Plato fact... do not, the, until tomorrow, the people of Plato don't believe in that judgment. They don't believe it was politically motivated. And even politically motivated, I had a reception recently. If I was a rejected person, nobody would have turned out. It was a massive reception that testified that we still stand by you, we believe in you, even when I was in prison. The kind of turnout, uh, Kujie became a maker. If you, are, you don't love the people, you don't work for the people, nobody, that trying moment, nobody will show up. So it's a demonstration of keeping faith with the people. And tomorrow, wherever the people are, that's where I am. The Senate leadership, uh, you know, in spite of uh, being asked to, did not declare your seat vacant while you were away. 
Uh, do I take it that that means you will be returning, especially in light of your most recent comment that, you know, uh, where you, you have learned the necessary lesson against next time that you are going to be continuing in public office after this? No, I'm not running this time around. I'm taking a break. Um, the argument that time was some of the zealous people from whatever quarters, the same group of people, felt uh, blah, blah, blah. They shouldn't pay me my running costs. The people said, look, they have not declared his man sit back. And the people have not recalled him. Uh, he attended all the, 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 the sittings. And uh, what is left? This was just out of the place. And I'm totally, I don't think that it was right. So, what was, you know, most time people don't follow the process, due process. What was, what, was, what was your experience? You alluded to it a bit earlier, but what was it like? Because, again, very f not many people have had the opportunity of going to the very zenith. As you said, you became governor at such a young age against the run of play, to uh, quote one of my uh, senior colleagues. Uh, but on the other hand, um, again, the depths of despair. Uh, I mean, going from that height and then ending up in prison. I want you to tell me a bit about that experience. What was it like when you found out you did have to go to prison? Well, the prison is one republic that is uh, a government of its own, <laughs> yes, you know, and uh, they don't have the best of facility, I must say. They don't have the best of facility in terms of, uh, it's not habitable for human beings. And I think that the, the federal government must have a look. When they talk about prison reform, there is the need to look at the condition, the sanitary places, and then also the, the, the environment is not that, the congestion. Like we can expand it. There are no VIPs. It's just like a punishment. So if they take people to that kind of problem, you are supposed to come out of form, not harden. Most of these young men that are there, they come out worse than when they were went in. And I don't think that's the essence of taking people to prison. That's supposed to be transformed, reform, and become better in society. And while we're there, I thank God for the grace he gave me and Nyame, I mean, the, Nyame was my senior. Uh, he was a governor in 1992 and was re-elected at the same time with all of us. And having served four years plus, it was one can not look that the gold factor came us alive. Some people wanted us to stay longer, but it didn't matter. We were able to I mean, persevere because it's not that we're going to farm. You stay with people, you mingle. We had some value here, face bills for young people who who couldn't afford? Some people are there for just 10 million naira, 100,000 naira, and they're kept for years. So it was an interesting uh, experience mixing people from different backgrounds, especially youngsters. So I won't say that it was a worthless one. Finally, I was in and I was taken to the hospital. So I was there for a long time, challenging time, but I also added value to the hospital where I was there, University Teaching Hospital. Wherever you are, live it better than you met it. And that has been my slogan. I must live Plato better than I made it, which I did. And I left the university with a testimony that I added value to that environment. So it was a rewarding experience. Some people would blame you. Some people listening to you now will say that, you know, that people who have occupied high position like yourself ought to have done more to uh, uh, renovate, revamp, and reform the prison system, and not only now talk about it when you became uh, 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 an inmate or, or a resident of the prisons that, you know, you, uh, Governor Daria, you were governor uh, for eight years. Uh, you've been in the Senate uh, subsequently. Uh, what exactly, before you ended up there, had you done as, um, uh, 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 as both mm -hmm. governor and senator to improve this system? Because now you are out, other people are still in there, other people would have joined uh, since you left, and they're going to meet the you know, the very bad conditions that you're talking about that exist there? Well, uh, you know, there's the pressure of power. The federal government, that is the, is the, the pressure is not on the concurrent list. It's on the exclusive list. There, there's an annual budget that takes care of it from the controller to the Minister of Interior. That is their responsibility. I wasn't uh, privileged to be on this uh, committee on the interior. So if you are not in the committee, you have no business jumping up there. You know, you, I was uh, in other committees. So the responsibility is quite that of the federal government to make sure that the minister in charge of the interior does his job, and not only that they are properly fed, the environment is habitable. This is an experience. These are people who are paid up. Some of them have contributed more. They shouldn't be consigned to a place like punishment.
So it's not that me, a governor has no business going to prison to check, oh, can I do this? That will amount to basilelessness because there is separation of power. It's like asking me, why did the president not go to your local government to do a cohort? That is not his responsibility. It is my responsibility. Let's, let, let me find out from you when, when this uh, pardon was announced by the federal government uh, and was approved by the president. Yeah. What was the first thing on your mind if, when that information was passed on to you? What was the first thing that came to you? Well, I said to God be the glory. And I thank Mr. President because uh, even though we're almost ending the, the tenure, I mean, one day free, freedom is priceless. One day free from that environment, you can never put a value on it. So I was excited. I was happy that I would reconnect with my family. I can move around and uh, celebrate, you know. So, Mr. President, we thank him. And we'll continue to thank him. Did you so feel... So if we left to other people, we'll continue to remain there, you know. That's, that I want, that's the question I wanted to ask. Did you feel betrayed, perhaps? Because if, as you say, this was not about the law, you were innocent, you weren't guilty, this was political... No, I don't want to go into that one. That one is part of history. The most important thing is that... We no, have it is not part of history, it. Governor Darye, because... There are people who will go through the same thing and won't have the end result that you have, which is this pardon. Yeah. They, will, they will probably be in prison. And in some instances, there may be a fatal result uh, for it. So it's good that you share with the, the public what exactly this is. Why I feel betrayed that some people are working like dark horses to, say, to allow us to stay there, frustrate the effort of Mr. President, which is illegal. That is why I said betrayal come in. It's not for me to pin the point for names. Because after we're pardoned, in my April 14, from April 14, we remained there for five months until some people started agitating. NGO said, free Niame, free Darye. And some people said, oh, it was, they were writing a gazette. What kind of gazette? We did for Alamasia. It didn't take more than two weeks. It's unusual. Do you understand? I do. It's unusual. I do. But then people, some people were saying that, the pardoning, we those who were saying that, were, so, those who were on the other side were saying that, pardoning you and Governor Darye, uh, at the, uh, Governor uh, Nyame, rather, at that point, uh, was like a blow to the battle against corruption because two of you were trophy uh, uh, victories uh, for the government and for the APC uh, uh, to point out that, look, there were no sacred cows, uh, Darius is in prison, Nyame is in prison for corruption. So did you feel that you were betrayed? No, you see, for people who are ignorant, government policy, sometimes people will just subject it to their personal interpretation. Under the COVID-19, uh, there was this present decongestion. Under the COVID-19, there was a, a, a policy on prison people that were suffering either terminal ill health or they were ill health or, or age, good conduct. They were supposed to be granted private pardon. We were not the only one. And after Darye and Nyambe were jailed, has it ended corruption? Like I told High Lordship, you can tell me for 200 years, if that would end corruption, I would say glory be to God. As corruption ended, you will answer it better than myself. You are in the, in the media. You do investigative journalism. You will know better. If corruption has ended, then we have served in life. Other than that, it's a contradiction. How do we end corruption then? Well, if we want to end corruption, it will not be a one day issue. You take corruption to cure corruption. And if you start deliberate policy, let me just take the issue of road, for example. If railway is working, the rail transport is working. Without these people with long vehicles sabotaging it, it will reduce a lot of hardship on our local people. It will reduce the prices of commodities, especially farm produce, and it will work. If it will also reduce uh, is high incidences of insecurity, but things are not working. Some people are benefiting from it. So they are blind or business will be affected. They are frustrating government measures. I'm sure this current government, the current administration, when they came on board, they outlined several strategies aiming at taking Nigeria to the next level. But unfortunately, people who believe they will lose out will frustrate it because it is business as usual. So it is we need the collective will, the resolve of every Nigerian and said, listen, the same president 19 some years back with, uh, with uh, um, when they came on board under the military, there was um, war against the discipline. It worked because there was determination. If everybody is determined, it will work. In that situation, let me bring you back to Plateau State now. Um, your, your tenure as governor was turbulent also because of communal violence in Plateau State. 
uh, uh, and that you, ha you had to deal with that. Uh, one of your successors, who is, as you said, your political ally now, uh, uh, Simon Lalong, who is the current governor, uh, had, had had to deal with that as well, although it does appear as if that has largely abated at this point. D do you think, perhaps, that it is possible that wherever it is that we are today, we are there because of political will and not necessarily because uh, uh, the violence has gone away. Uh, under the military, several issues were neglected. They were not properly addressed. And uh, there were a couple of violence, but we brought under control. Like I said, that even the state of emergency that was brought, it wasn't that we were unable to bring it under control. It was just that somebody was looking for the slightest opportunity to strike. And um, the man took advantage of that. It wasn't only in Plateau. They have been killed in Kaduna, in Katsina, in some other part of the country. And they took that one as a significant case because of one person's agenda. He wanted to actualize it and he will be rewarded, whatever, I don't know. Unfortunately, he's from not able to reap that what he planted. From what you're saying, Governor Darye, it does appear as if uh, you still have some element of uh, disappointment. I don't, want, I, I don't know whether to also add the word, you know, some, some evidence of anger, some level of bitterness against uh, those who you have accused of, of, of creating this situation for you. And I want to presume, well, because really at that it. time, why, why, did, why so long afterwards do you, does it seem as if you're still so angry at them? No, 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 no. What I'm saying is I'm only responding to your question. I put that yeah. behind me. I'm not angry. No. What I'm saying is what has happened has happened. But if you're referring me to a history, I must put it within context, not out of context. The state of emergency was not only illegal, but uncalled for, because you don't destroy political structure. Because the House of Assembly was, was abandoned, was dissolved. The executive was dissolved. If this, the concern is very, very clear, where there is crisis in one place, you will invite Mr. President, they will move the army to that place and condone that place. Not that you will chase people away. In collaboration, you work. But the man felt if it was still on, on seat, it would not be possible. That was an unusual set of emergency, even in America, all over the world if you check history. Let me bring you to the planks on which your, your party today, APC, ran in 2015, uh, on which it yeah. was voted into power. Uh, you mentioned them earlier in the interview when you talked about three uh, plants. Uh, it talked about uh, the state of security, it talked about the economy, and then it talked about uh, 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 the battle against corruption. We have, we have spoken, we have touched on uh, that of anti-corruption, and of course, I mean, we've talked about your uh, your travails in that regard. But in the case of security, which was the first question I asked you, there are many who have said that, you know, the current government, the APC government at federal and at many state levels, the APC has majority of the states, uh, have failed in that regard. People have been kidnapped everywhere. Most uh, farmers cannot go to their farms. Uh, the herders are, you know, are trampling over people's uh, farming rights and all of that. And then the herders themselves, are also facing bandits now who are rustling their cattle. Uh, and that all this came up between 2015 and now. So on the, on this, on the security banner, the, the score is very low. Yes, well, um, I cannot hold um, brief for the CRC, but I believe recently when the Senate made the resolution, if they don't end it up, they will commence some processes. There have been some uh, changes. Even though not appreciable uh, changes, we still have Incidences of kidnapping, cattle rustling here and there. Nobody is happy with it, what is going on. That's why I said, if we have the collective will, the collective will, I emphasize that because everybody must be involved. This kind of stealing, people know who, they are, who is stealing. They're not being stolen by gods or by angels or by whatever. If we're able to have the courage to say, look, these are the people doing this business, it will end. But as long as we condone them, because we come from the same ethnic group or the same religion or the same environment, the thing will never end, even if an angel can take over tomorrow. But in the case of the APC, that appears to be what is going on, because one of the other things that has happened is that the ticket, the APC presidential ticket, consists of two people uh, who are from the same religious persuasion, and that people are saying that's not inclusive enough. You are a Northern Christian because you are from Plato State, uh, and I know for a fact that you are a Christian. Uh, and there have been, there's yeah. been this back and forth over 
whether or not uh, it was uh, quite it was politically savvy of the APC to choose two candidates who are from the same religion, knowing what Nigeria is today. What's your own view coming from the perspective that you are a Northern Christian? I would rather remain neutral because when this event took place, I was still in prison. And I don't know what informed that this is a very decision because it will be too late to criticize it. You understand? So I would rather remain neutral and not comment on such a sensitive part. I don't want to contribute to anybody's downfall. Uh, but on a more general level, what do you make of the sectional tendencies that have taken over the country? Um, uh, you have uh, people who are asking for certain parts of the country to go their separate ways. There are others who are calling for restructuring and so on. Some have said that the National Assembly should actually take the lead uh, uh, in, in some of these ventures. Uh, for example, revisiting the 2014 National Conference and its recommendations on a plethora of subjects, including state police and other things like that, fiscal restructuring. At least I know that uh, you participated in some of those deliberations. You had, uh, what, what happened had not yet happened uh, at that time. So what do you make of that? Because now we're at another crossroads. Yes, I would rather uh, suggest that we revisit the confab and talk, because when people are, when there's a dialogue, it reduces tension. When people are talking, who understand each other better, rather than somebody said, oh, the Middle West should go, the Odudua should go, the South West should go, the North East should go, or the South East should go. I believe after the confab, people who are sincere on the table will achieve far milestone politically. If you look at the way Russia is run, it's run on region, but with a central government. And yet there is peace and harmony. Where what are we afraid of? As long as this is what Nigerian collectively resolve, Abuja resolution. At the end of the day, everybody will be in peace. But then the National Assembly had an opportunity to revisit that document because I remember that there was a time when they were, you know, when they were looking at the issue, particularly of policing and all of that, that they could amend the constitution via uh, uh, laws in the National Assembly to put in place some of these things, what you described as a, a piecemeal. Uh, but it failed to pass even the National Assembly. And some people accuse you and your colleagues uh, of pandering to your own interests first, you know, before the nations. Uh, no. and that's why you couldn't do it. But I think that if the executive, because it was an executive document, if they send somebody to the National Assembly, but the time is not there. Next year, don't forget that with the lifting of uh, sanctions and ban on, on campaign, electronic, I mean, sharing uh, activities, people will be too busy to engage that. We don't want them to pass it, and at the end of the day, it doesn't become like one document that we need to be changed again. Let the next session revisit it properly. In Nigeria, we're not going to disintegrate from now to uh, May 29th. So a willing government, a willing president, a willing National Assembly, new bride, new commitment, I believe Nigeria will touch them. Let's reduce it to specific. In terms of the way we are running, in terms of the way we are running the politics at the moment, and I alluded to it, to it when, I, when we started and I was talking about two big events next year. Uh, of course, all attention is focused on the election, but there is another event that is supposed to happen at around the same time as the election. And that other activity is as controversial as Nigeria's elections at any point that we have done it, which is the national census. Uh, and uh, but because, of course, the national census also has political implications in terms of how seats yes. in the National Assembly are allotted and all of that. What do you make of that? Was it, what, do you think it was uh, viable to put both the elections and the census at around the same time? These are two big events, you know, uh, involving everybody. Well, they're not taking place on the same day. The election is like... Um, Maybe two or three weeks that is done and they put behind it. But I think the government is determined to put a correct figure behind them. The census is more involving. I believe that with um, advanced technology, with the use of drones, the use of computers, it will become very easy to do enumeration. It is not just going to write figures the way you and manner you want. They will plan the logistics. And at the end of the day, we'll have a pro not very 100%, even 100%, let's say 90% uh, correct figure of human beings. 
Uh, sometimes people get lazy, they don't go to Ethereum, they have some figures, but everybody must be involved. Because in future, when we're looking at a revenue formula, uh, the population and the landmass are equal indices that they use. So I don't think there are contaminants that anybody will say, oh, they're happening on the same day. The police will come and go, and then we'll continue with our own uh, numeration. So that is okay. Do you have any fears that um, we might have things difficult? People say that, you know, in the run-up to every election cycle since 1999, uh, there have always been these fears that things could go wrong, that the results could bring about uh, 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 violence and disagreement and all of that. But in 2023, is again now a transition. Uh, no incumbent, at least talking at the presidential level, and in fact at many of the governorship levels, no incumbent is yeah. up for re-election. Uh, and that those ones are the electoral circles that are even more dangerous uh, because there are people uh, who are now, everybody is more or less on an even kill on the, on, on the field. And that those who hold power, the coercive forces, they are on their way out. That's so they probably have real, no, no real interest in what happens uh, once they, uh, when they are exiting. Do you harbor fears about these coming elections? Now, given the pronouncing and regular set, constant settlement as the president, he wants to conduct a free and fair election so that it will be adjourned in the eye of the international community as one of the fairest and the, uh, and the most uh, credible election. Nobody will want you are exiting an office and you want to mess up your name because you are no more running for election. No, it's a sense of history. So it's the collective result of every Nigerian. All the parties, everybody is making sure that, look, the right person will win. The bigger ones, the APC, the PDP, the Labour, everyone, including the smaller ones, new Nigerian party. So the empires are not going to sleep. Nobody will allow her to let loose because somebody wants to mess up. Them. And there are clear punishments for people who want to disrupt elections. The security will not be sleeping on that day. I can assure you with prayers, with it, apart from expectation, we want to call on people to pray, Christian and Muslim alike, to pray that there will be peace in the land. Sometimes we criticize and we don't pray. This man is a bad leader, this man not doing well, the security is bad, we will hardly pray. If we pray and invite God into the situation, believe me, it will work. It has happened in the Bible, where God just stopped and says, stand still and see my salvation today. The judge you see, you'll see them no more. We can apply in our situation. God has not gone to sleep. He has not traveled. He neither sleep nor slumber. So if we invite God, I believe that at the end of the day, we'll say, oh my God, it, our fears has gone. So that is the role. And everybody must be uh, seen to be responsible. But not about who this is a process. Chief Daria, a lot of people listening to you will say that perhaps a career in the theological uh, uh, field will probably be the next stop for you especially because you say you are taking a break uh, from the political field in this cycle. Uh, uh, but I, I, I want to ask you about uh, the states now. Uh, you, of course, being a former governor, uh, you are more you're familiar with uh, the challenges at the level of the states. Many people say attention is focused at the federal level, but that a lot more in terms of challenge is there at the states, the subnational levels. Many of them are basically insolvent. They can't pay salaries, they owe months, yeah. sometimes years of pensions and gratuities. They are owing contractors for projects co completed, yet the people expect them to build schools and hospitals and so on. The IGR is not there uh, because the federal power is also sinking uh, uh, in terms of uh, size. What do you make of the challenge at the state level? And more importantly, what should those who want to take over now be looking out for? What should those who want to vote for them be thinking of as important to select the proper person? Yeah, well, um, what took us in trouble? When this government came on board, I was excited when they said they wanted to do zero-based budget. Unfortunately, we didn't implement that. We went to the historical budget again, and civil servant, you know, they had the change. If we have slim budget, not having bogus, Elephant project, it will take us out of debt. Even if it is one, two a project you do. But everybody wants, there's no continuity. Unless we abandon project here and there. If we have continuity, I believe that it will reduce the debt. And then we look at way of improving in IGA, like your slide said. Definitely most of them have uh, overborrowed, highly geared. 
unfortunately. Uh, I believe that um, when a governor comes on, on board, or the governors come on board, they must sit down, set up a transition committee, look at the wide industries, and then where do we need to cut down costs? Some people are traveling by jet. We don't need to. You can travel by road. If the roads are bad, appeal to the federal government, then they fix the road is cheaper and less costly. Uh, some of the areas that uh, you know eat um, of our resources, we can cut down on that one. And I believe we'll pull it out of debt. But if we keep borrowing, we'll get to a point we can't borrow any longer. And then it will become insolvent. There are those who said we have already reached that level where we, we, we possibly, it doesn't appear as if we can borrow any longer, but that uh, you and your colleagues in the National Assembly, you keep approving for the federal government to continue to borrow. And, and just, uh, just recently, the head of service of the Federation uh, admitted that the federal government has been borrowing uh, to pay salaries uh, 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 over the last uh, uh, period of time. So that means that not only are we borrowing for the purpose of capital expenditure, we are also borrowing to cover recurrent expenditure. And that uh, the National Assembly is not blameless in this, not only for its approval, but because a large chunk of the money is also going to you uh, and your colleagues. Well, I am not a member of the Nine Assembly, so I can't hold brief for them. I don't know what informed the judgment, because if we have, uh, like, under the Seventh and Sixth Assembly, when executives pass in this one, we're subject to scrutiny. And you check, look at it, look at it. What is the source of repayment? What is the time frame? What are the loans on ground? What is the loan portfolio? How much of this is going to this one? And I think they should have the courage to say, look, we must step down some of them. But if they just say, borrow, 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 at the end of the day, you know, we are at the expense of the general masses. And if a revolution comes, everybody will be affected. You know what happened from NSAS? I don't want to go into that topic now. In uh, the final analysis, uh, and uh, as we wrap uh, up this interview, I must ask you once again, uh, you've gone through, or you've gone through all what you've explained in the course of the interview, but some people will still no doubt say that Governor Joshua Darie uh, former governor of Plato State and senator, has no business pontificating to anybody about anything because as far as they are concerned, uh, you've been found guilty and you've been sent to prison and that uh, you are only talking today because of the presidential pardon you were granted. What will you say to those people and to those in your state uh, who will be looking at you today to say, here is this man. Uh, I don't know whether to believe or not that, you know, Indeed, he did what they said he did. What would you say to them that could possibly pass? The most important thing is like Jesus um, made the woman in committing adultery say, Go and sin no more. Uh, uh, let's assume that that was our sin. We committed sin. We have seen no more. We are now sent. We've been cleared from that uh, uh, accusation. We receive a presidential pardon. And that pardon covers everything. You understand? That doesn't mean that we're going to sit down idle as if. There's nothing to do. We must contribute. In the, the Second Republic, let Babala and Co were jailed for 99 years, a couple of years, and many of them. At the end of the day, they were the people leading us. So experience is a better teacher. What we have seen, many people have not seen. What we have gone through, people have not gone through in their comfort zone. I believe we are more positioned to offer better leadership than anybody who has not been there. We were not, not that we are not doing it, but we are more committed. And we're glad the young ones. It's on that note that I'll say to you, thank you very much, uh, Chief Joshua Daria, for your time on the program today. It's been a pleasure speaking with you, and congratulations uh, uh, on the pardon. Thank you so much for the opportunity to talk to Nigerians, and I uh, wish you well, channels, and we're partners in progress. Let's pray for a better Nigeria, that our children and our great-grandchildren will not leave Nigeria, but remain here and contribute. And I'll appeal to the federal government that let them resolve their dialogue with us so that we can have our children back to school. Thank you. That's our program today. Would, of course, like to hear from you on the conversation. Our social media handles are right there on your screen. You can also listen to this and previous episodes of the program via our podcast. Please visit our website, channelstv.com forward slash podcast to get started. I am Ladi Akiri Duluali. Goodbye.